Welcome to the Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You are with Ian. And with Mike. And together, we've all been rereading and relishing the Aubrey Matcher novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, it's been quite a week for big episodes, hasn't it? Tell us where we got to in last week's bumper and where might we be headed this week? Oh, I'd be delighted, Ian. Last week in Chapter 6, we had Jack and Stephen attending a party at Queenie's. And at that party, Canning offered Jack command of a brand new privateer. Also, Jack saw Mrs. Williams and played up Stephen's wealth to her. She was also very impressed by seeing the First Lord's interest in Jack. Diana greeted Stephen and Jack both very warmly, again disrupting the relationship between our two heroes. And then Diana, during the party, cut Jack off when he said he was afraid to call on her, afraid for being, you know, that he might be arrested for debt. Well, Jack tried to think about Sophie versus Diana a little more logically, but he got mm. mugged <laughs> right <laughs> as he started. And then Jack gave up his post captain claim at the Admiralty and accepted command of the Polycrest. So that was last time. This time, Stephen finally joins Jack on the Polycrest, and we find him wondering about the relationship between him and Jack. We have the return of a dear friend. Pulling celebrates his promotion. There are multiple perils, a run-in with debt collectors, unusual sailing, more bear references, a new crew, disputes over discipline, talk of mutinies, more on authority, and the return of Admiral Hart. Oh, my. Oh, my. So much to go out there. So much classic Patrick O'Brien material to get stuck into. Um, let, let's start with arrangements for a dinner. Uh, Stephen is sitting writing a note to Jack saying that he's arrived in Portsmouth early in the day and would like to report aboard, but begs, meanwhile, the pleasure of Jack's company at dinner ashore. In the diary writing immediately afterwards, Stephen reflects that his signature on this note was signed, your affectionate, humble servant. And he sees the feeling that he has towards Jack as still being that of affection. It's affection that's brought him to Portsmouth. However, as he writes to himself in his diary, even a frigid, self-sufficing man needs something of this interchange if he is not to die in his unmechanical part. Natural philosophy, music, dead man's conversation is not enough. And having thought that, deep thought about what he's getting from the relationship, he goes on to think about Jack. He believes that Jack has real affection for him. He calls it as real an affection as is consonant with his unreflecting jovial nature. He knows that Jack's distress had moved Stephen and that had brought him here. And he, Stephen, that is, asks himself, how long will this affection withstand the attrition of mute daily conflict? And Mike, mm -hmm. that, that, that phrase, mute daily conflict, was horrible. Like that, that's, right. that's saying for real what we've sort of suspected has been happening between Jack and Stephen for a couple of chapters now. His kindness for me will not prevent him from pursuing Diana and what he does not wish to see, he will not see. And he examines this apparent kind of double think on the part of Jack. He doesn't believe that Jack is consciously a hypocrite, but what Stephen describes as the quod volunt credere applies with particular force to him. Uh, Mike, this is a, a really chilling moment. The rift between Jack and Stephen that we were starting to get an idea of has reasserted itself, both of them realising that seeing Diana again at Queenie's party had changed their relationship and opened up this, this gap, not this deeper than rivalry, this antagonism potentially between them. And from this diary entry and from some of what we heard in Jack's thinking in the previous chapter, it seems like Stephen's much more aware of this now than Jack is. The Jack, who is described once again as an unreflecting and jovial this is real, real self-examination by Stephen, right? It, it it is, and it's it's fascinating because you know Stephen's always our enlightenment guy, our yeah. scientist sort of guy, and you know we were talking last week about sense and sensibility with Jane Austen, and and I think Stephen 
thinks that all of this is having a tremendous toll on his soul. And I would say, dare we say, on his sensibilities. You know, this, right. this usual sense, Stephen, is deep in his sensibilities here. Ah. And it wouldn't be self-examination by Stephen if it didn't have a Latin quote in it. So quod volunt credere, we owe a lot this week to Karen Ruff, our good friend and consulting Latinist to the podcast. It's an abbreviated reference to credunt quod volunt credere. They believe what they want to believe. We think it might have been attributed to Caesar at some point. There's no evidence that Caesar actually said it. It's been cited as a theological commonplace, says Karen, back in the 17th century. The philosopher Locke uses it also as a truism. It's just, uh, it, it's a phrase. It, it's a phrase and it's pretty well established and has has a fairly straightforward meaning at that time and in the uh, context of someone like Stephen. Now, Having considered Jack's motivations, Stephen continues in his diary here. He's at a complete loss and as he reflects on Diana's behavior. First of all, her kindness towards Jack and then towards him, her turning away as though from an enemy. He wonders if she had become entangled with Jack while she was kind of playing with him, but he's still puzzled about what's going on with her. Would she ever part with her ambition, I think he means her ambition to to find a place in the world, and that probably means getting fixed up with a with a with a, with a wealthy man who'll give her independence. Would she ever part with her ambition? Surely not. And he is even less marriageable than I, less a lawful prize. Can this be a vicious inclination? He's speculating here about Diana's character. He thinks to himself that oh, Jack is a reasonably good-looking fellow, but he Stephen is not, and maybe in a, in a slightly bizarre but i guess plausible connection here supposes that maybe jack's rather ludicrous account of stephen's wealth and the castle in spain had passing through mrs williams turned stephen from being an ally friend even an accomplice into being an opponent there are a thousand wild possibilities at work here. Stephen's lost and disturbs. He he reflects that maybe his laudanum and the distances and the business and the and some action might cool down this chain of thoughts. He goes on to say that he dreads the contrary heating effect of jealousy, something he's never felt before for himself. And even though all knowledge and experience and literature and history and common observation told him of the strength of jealousy, he, he writes that he had no sense of its true nature at all. Nosce te ipsum, my dreams appall me. So, Mike, there, there are two things to dig into here. Let's take the nosce te ipsum bit first, because once again, we, we owe a little debt to Karen. It was debated even in, in the old ancient classical times in antiquity where this came from. It originated in the, the Greek tag Agnosti se auton, which is a sort of literal translation meaning know thyself. The connection to Delphi is not very material to Stephen's self-reflection. Karen writes to us, I also hear an echo of the similar proverb, physician heal thyself, but maybe that's just free association. Stephen's musings are fascinating. He associates the heat of jealousy and he's thinking ab about and using the language of the humours of bile and blood and the um, the, the the tempers that give people character. And Karen goes on to wonder whether we might actually also be hearing an echo of Shakespeare. We've got Othello and Iago here, the two original green-eyed monsters. And uh, we're going to get to know a bit about Jack's own jealous personality, his own green-eyed monster, many, many books later in the Commodore. So Know Thyself takes us a lot deeper than just look in the mirror. Mike, how about this, my dreams appall me? Because I, I never spotted this as a, as a reference, but maybe there's something behind it. Yeah, I, I didn't either. And there definitely is something behind it. Again, a tip of the hat to Karen. She spotted this and, it, and it's great. This is a quotation from Wuthering Heights. We we're talking last uh, time about Jane Austen versus Bronte, the Bronte sisters. This in this Bronte, this is a line spoken by Catherine and uh, it, the context for her distress and brain fever is a disastrous. It's it's not just a love triangle. There are actually you know <laughs> multiple men and multiple women. So you know some other geometric figure here. And given Jack and Stephen's situation with Sophie with Diana, 
it's not hard to assume that this illusion, says Karen, is intentional on the part of O'Brien. And and I think, yeah, absolutely, especially nested in this whole paragraph where Mr. Sense Stephen is Mr. Sensibility Stephen here. So, and I'm with you, Stephen. I'm, I'm, if, you know, you said to Paul, I would say, you know, horrified. I'm horrified by all this as well, <laughs> by all means. Well, we get a little momentary break here. As Stephen remembers for a minute, coming into coach, coming into town, stopping, looking out over the harbor. And O'Brien writes, this is Stephen, I felt a longing for the sea. It has a great cleanliness. There are moments when everything on land seems to me torturous, dark, and squalid, though to be sure, squalor is not lacking aboard a man of war. And having thought for this brief pause about, oh, it'll all be better at sea a little bit. And we'll, we'll hear this throughout the, throughout the chapter here. Stephen returns to us thinking yeah. about, you know, how much Jack's comments to Mrs. Williams may have increased her kind of idea of, of both Jack and Stephen's worth. And he thinks, you know, right. if Jack's estate was clear, uh, you know, I don't think Mrs. Williams would object to Jack and neither would Sophie. So, you know, there might still be this match here. But he thinks Sophie, and and O'Brien writes, would wither away an old maid rather than disobey her mother, marry without her consent. No Gretna Green. And Ian, we're going to come back to you on Gretna Green because you know this one much better than I do there. Well, Stephen thinks of Sophie as, in his words, one of those rare creatures in whom principle does not do away with humor. And he remembers, you you know, all these times that he's seen her quiet and privately jolly. And and, uh, O'Brien emphasizes this word jolly. And Stephen thinks, you know, that's a great rarity in women, including Diana. So very fascinating. Then, uh, you know, another thing that kind of iced my heart a little bit, Stephen says that he would be very sorry to see Sophie take the habit of unhappiness that is, in his word, is coming on her fast. And I thought, oh, no good. But Put unhappiness to one side, Ian, Gretna Green. <laughs> well, it's funny. It's, it's, it's a name known to loads of us Brits who might remember it as the place where people would, m- maybe in tradition or at least in kind of fantasy land, when, when you're young and you want to get married and your parents won't let you, back in the days when that was a, that was a legal thing in, uh, in English law, people used to run away up north just a few hundred yards over the border at Gretna Green in Scotland, I think in Dumfries in Galloway, but I can't remember exactly which county in Scotland. Um, there is Gretna Green, and that's the, the 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 nearest place to the border with England that you can get to and get married without your parents' permission. So it's the kind of Las Vegas wedding chapel of 18th century England. <laughs> nice, nice. And, you know, for those of you who don't have fond memories of, of being deeply in love in England, you know, years ago at 16, you could always consult Dean King's Sea of Words, and he actually also explains this, but not nearly as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stephen looks out his in window, and he's looking at the Sunday crowds on the streets, and he's, he's thinking to himself, look at these all these officers and wives and children, everybody all dressed up and scrubbed with what he calls Sunday faces. And as he's thinking about this, a waiter says, hey, there's a lieutenant here to see you. And Stephen says, well, you know, show him up. And it sounds like a bull is coming up the stairs. And then Pooling's face appears lighting up the room with his happiness and his new blue coat saying that his commission has come in the mail. He's been made at last. And Stephen wishes him joy. And and he wonders, gosh, can this guy contain any more joy? To the point where he says, you know, Tom, you've been drinking. And, And he's glad to hear that Tom is only drunk with what Stephen calls present happiness. So Stephen says, Long may it last. And and Amen. exactly. Stephen keeps saying, you know, Lieutenant Pullings and, and, and Pullings is just more delighted every time he hears his word associated with Lieutenant. Um, now, Tom says that Parker, the first Lieutenant on the Polycrest, had said the same thing. You know, you know, you're, you're happy now. Long may it last. And Pullings calls Parker a gray old toad, but then, you know, thinks, yeah, I'm not being very kind. I can understand how someone would grow sour if they'd been a lieutenant for 35 years without ever getting their own ship. So a little insight Sheesh. into Mr. Parker here. Yeah. Stephen offers Pullings a drink and uh, Pullings gladly accepts, but he says, you know, can I take the liberty of toasting Captain Aubrey? 
my dear love to him, and may he have all his heart desires. Without him, I should never have got my step. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, Stephen's thinking, yeah, I don't want Jack to have all his heart nope. desires or, or nope. some other part of him. Maybe, yeah, get what your heart desires, but <laughs> not the rest. And then Pullings, having toasted Jack, remembers, oh my gosh, I came here to deliver the captain's reply to Stephen's note saying, yep, he'd love to have dinner with you at three o'clock. And Stephen invites Tom to join them, but he says, no, he can't. He's going to go out there short of men, and he's going to try to grab, press some sailors from uh, an Indian man that's coming through. But he's sure that the captain will enjoy dinner because the captain has been working like night and day to get the ship ready. And Tom says that he has only seen him with a bit of bread and cold beef in his hand the entire time since Tom arrived. So... Tom's out the door. Yeah, off, off he goes as quickly as he came with all of that kind of joy and effusion. He's gone again. Stephen watches him head off, reflects on the fact that he's off to, to press more men. And we, we've been hearing a bit about the barbarity, the petty barbarity of pressing the crew and getting the ship refitted. And he, he thinks to himself, devotion is a fine thing, a moving thing to see. But who's going to pay for that amiable young man's zeal, what blows, oaths, moral violence, brutalities. And it, we've had this nice contrast here between the civilized, law-abiding people of the town who are going about their business and how, as we look out the window, we see the, we see the whores and we see the drunkenness. The, the town shows a different face when the sailors show up, which is a nice little counterpoint to Stephen saying, life is so much better when we're away at sea. Right, right. Now, as he's looking out of the window here, he sees Jack walking down the street and Jack is being followed by two burly fellas. And we're all remembering, I guess, just last chapter that Jack was tiptoeing about London, um, dodging dates with Diana Villiers because of his fear that he might get caught for debt. And maybe this is catching up with him again here. Apparently, these two fellas... One of them in particular, the one with the broken nose, had tried to come aboard the ship, but the crew had stopped him. And because there are two of them, he's now reflecting that perhaps the, the broken nose guy is trying to put the other one in turn onto Jack's trail. It's Sunday, which means that today Jack can't be touched. He can go about his business. So they're going to have this big feast. And Stephen takes Jack into the dining room now and tells him what he's ordered them. And hearing this bill of fare... And getting indoors and getting back with Stephen, Jack's face goes from an unhealthy grey to a rosy glow. What a good host you are, Stephen, he's saying. You've ordered everything that Jack needs most, but can't hardly name himself. And Jack says, this is much better, in turn, than the wretched dinner that I invited you to in Mahon. And he remembers that the people there had been ignorant of Jack calls what, did, what was his sort of Spanish. And this, of course, was Jack's bad Spanish, speaking to folks who speak Catalan. So that was a you know a, a double misunderstanding. Stephen assures Jack that that early meal in Mejon was in fact a nice meal. And they're both now looking forward with some anticipation to this great feast for pullings. And it, it's really touching, Mike, as we see this scene unfold. We've got the cheerful naivete of Jack and he's willing to look back and reflect on, on the good times past. And Stephen, for his part, I think sees it a bit more dispassionately, but meanwhile, he still is Jack's friend and he knows him well and wants to look after him. Yeah. Well, over tea, Jack tells Stephen all about the Polycrest. And this is because Stephen has said, you know, Jack, tell me about your ship, you know, tell me. And uh, so again, I think this is more Stephen, like, let me, let me look after my friend here. Jack says, well, she's like a floating shore battery. She's got 24, 32 pounder carronades. He says they could take on a 36-gun frigate if we could get close enough. And Stephen says, well, using that logic, you could take on a three-decker first rate at six inches, or you could take on two of them if you can wedge yourself in between them and fire from both sides. He says, you know, so tell me, how far do these carronades fire? And Jack says, well, you have to really be within pistol shot to be accurate. And Stephen says, so what's the enemy doing with its lung guns as you try to get within pistol shot. And Jack says, well, that's that's the problem. They're really short of able seamen, and they need a lot more to be able to work the ship. 
so that they can get close enough to use these guns that they have. Right. And and we had this tricky trade-off in the previous chapter aboard the Lord Nelson, their weight of metal in the broadside and number of men to fight the ship. And this is a concern that Jack hasn't escaped from. He's got the same concern here with the Polycrest. So getting some more men is the priority. They've been trying, or Jack has been trying, to put together some kind of recruiting pamphlet, and it strikes him that maybe Scriven could step in and help us out here. And uh, Jack is, meanwhile, conveniently nodded off by the fire as Stephen's talking, and he's woken up again. Are you sure that you're taking the utmost caution not to get taken by bailiffs? asks Stephen. Jack says, yes, I'm refusing appointments, I'm turning down invitations. Everything I'm everything is turned down except for the upcoming feast for pullings. And that is going to happen in an out-of-the-way place where the ship's boats land. And so he's pretty confident that he can have this on the down low. Meanwhile, as they've been discussing this, Scriven steps back in. And Mike, everybody's perspective on Scriven might be about to change. But for now, I'm, I'm enjoying that he's there. And I'm enjoying that he can turn his writerly skills to fixing Jack Aubrey's problems. And yeah, we've said this before. Scriven is a, a little bit of a tiny sliver of the character of Patrick O'Brien, I think, represented here. And gleefully, we get this very, very ostentatious prose read out to us. He's brought back this marketing brochure featuring £5,000 of possible prize money, your last chance to make a fortune sailing with the fabulous Captain Aubrey on this amazing new vessel. It's 12 times the weight of metal of the Sophie, and therefore, who knows, 12 times as much prize money as the uh, Sophie brought in in its last cruises. And the, the, the tobacco, the beer, the wine, and the grog. It, Mike, th- this is very much the hard sell, right? Oh, oh, it is. You know, I'm, I'm thinking back to you know, the, the TV commercials. But wait, there's more. Wait, call now. Operators are standing by. <laughs> I love this. So Jack goes ahead and corrects one or two of the more outlandish claims in this uh, uh, in this document and asks Scriven to go and print off 100 posters and 200 handbills. And as they're waiting there for a boat, Jack tells Stephen that the officers may indeed look rough from all the fitting out activity, especially Parker, um, who had been taking care of this all on his own up until now. And Jack turns to thinking about Parker. He's, like we know, he's a Long service lieutenant who's never yet managed to get a command of his own. He's in his 50s. He's very strict and precise, but he's very prone to this harsh, hazing discipline, to what you might even say is abuse of authority. And Jack knows that he's going to have to tread carefully here. He can't stop Parker from being seen as the day-to-day runner of the ship. It would be a, a mistake for a kind of easygoing captain to undermine a stern first lieutenant. But Jack knows the difference between a happy ship and an unhappy ship. He says he's served in hell afloat type ships, and he wants no part of that. They're on the boat. They're coming out, and Jack points out the polycrest. And Stephen is a little afraid to call her a ship as he's looking at. So he calls her, oh, that that three-masted vessel? Uh, (laughs) But then he says, you know, actually, the only thing that looks strange about her is that both ends are sharp. But he says... Of course, when St. Brendan made his voyage on his small boat, his Cora, that it was shaped like that. And Jack says, oh, well, did it stay well? Did it sail against wind and tide? And Stephen (laughs) replies, certainly. Did he not reach the islands of the blessed? (laughs) And I I love that that Jack's concern about his ship is so great that he's reaching for any assurance here. Especially, he always loves Stephen's assurance here. (laughs) So this saint from really... um, 484, maybe we think, to 577, Brendan the Navigator, Brendan the Voyager, uh, was actually an abbot in Ireland, said to be a solo sea traveler to the outlying British Isles. He's the patron saint of sailors and of the U.S. Navy. So it, huh. it actually, in Annapolis in the Channel, you get a beautiful window of, of St. Brendan right next to St. Andrew, a disciple that made his living on the sea here. But he's also the patron saint of people who are unafraid because he was said to be fearless in setting out in uncharted waters and into uncertain circumstances. And there's it was many years before accounts of St. Brendan were written down. So we don't know for sure what actually happened. But some some folks think that Perhaps he may have sailed as far as North America, 
um, it's been said that Columbus had a map that noted on it this island of the blessed that you know St. Brendan had discovered, putting it somewhere in the Western Atlantic Ocean. Hmm. And some actually said that Columbus used some of Brendan's navigational guidance when he made his voyage of discovery. So how much of this is apocryphal? How much of that is great? But I think Jack would love this patron saint of sailors here. Yeah. So... A nice little little reflection. And as this has all been going on, Pullings returns from his boat trip out into the channel with seven seamen described as being able seamen but cross. Hmm. And meanwhile, Scriven's posters have, to everybody's surprise, winkled out five more volunteers who've stepped aboard only to be pressed. And Jack's spirits are higher now than when he'd taken Sophie out of Port Mahon for the first time. He and Stephen are waiting as Parker, with his kind of heavy-handed discipline, badges the crew to get their launch in the water. A rowboat emerges from the fog, and there are two well-dressed four-deck hands, men of war's men, and Jack stares down. And who are these two fellas but Barrett Bonden and Joe Place? And how the heck, he thinks, did these two manage to get here amidst the hottest press in years? No, nobody knows, and Jack knows better than to ask too closely. Bonden says that Joe Place, who's his cousin, had heard that the captain was afloat again. And of course, Jack remembers Place. He's old, he's stupid, he's reliable when he's sober, and a great hand at a variant of the Matthew Walker knot, which we'll just talk about in a second. They've come, because they like the idea of a chance with a cruise with Jack Aubrey, to enter voluntarily. If so be you can find room, sir, says Bonden. And Jack thinks this is as close to open mirth and kind of banter as would be allowed from someone like Bonden addressed to someone like Jack. He says he'll stretch a point for the two of them. Uh, He'll have to earn his place, which is a heavy handed pun on Joe's second name. He says that you'll earn this by teaching the boys, the midshipmen, the Matthew Walker. Jack tells Parker to enter them as seamen in the books, place as a folksman and Bonden as my coxswain. So this, this is Mike. This is a nice little moment for Jack. He's getting one of his favourite followers back, Barrett Bonden, and and who only knows how and who only knows what Bonden and Place had gone through to get here. Um, the Matthew Walker knot. Just talk about that for a second. Um, there are lots of different variations of it. It's a knot that you tie in the end of a rope to keep it from fraying. It's a slightly decorative knot. You put it in the end of a piece of running rigging or maybe even the end of a bell pull. That there's a, a picture that we have here that we'll share on our socials. If any of you want to give it a try, it looks like, you know, it it ought to be a doable thing. Anyhow, Mike, back with Bondon being part of Jack's establishment again, that means he can take his place steering the launch, right? Yeah, he he steps right in. Boom, they're, you know, they're about to head off. Bond and steering the launch. And I'm thinking all's right with the world again here. Right. And Jack asked about Bonded's nephew, the one Jack had rated midshipman on the Sophie. I think, you know, Jack was thinking about Bond and Bond's going, no, I can't read. Take my nephew. And Bond says he had been pressed out of a merchantman and was only a foremast Jack, but he was on the York when she foundered in the North Sea with the loss of all hands. And this you know, you can tell this really takes a toll on Jack. Uh, you know, O'Brien says he's just shaking his head, listening to Patrick Tall read this is just oh, so good here. <laughs> and Jack's saying, you know, he would have made his way. He's thinking, you know, gosh, this kid was so good. He was going to be so good. And Jack's remembering that the York, like the Polycrest, was built at Hickman's Yard. Yeah. And everybody had said that when she was put to sea, She was in such a state that no lanterns were needed in the hold because of the glow of the rotten wood they'd used to make her. So she was certainly in no shape for the North Sea gale that took her. Thinking about this, Jack hears, you know, the launch is sailing by all these three deckers and he hears somebody holler out, what ho, the carpenter's mistake. And all, you know, everybody on the ships are laughing at him and this brings his spirits low again. Yeah, because we know that Jack identifies with his ships, right? And the uh, anybody casting shade on his ship is casting shade on Jack. Ah, it, it, it's quite a grim moment as well that neglect and jobbery in the yard is more than just petty corruption. It's actually going to lead to people being in harm's way out at sea. 
So now we see Pullings ready for his feast. He's standing there. He's got his parents. He's got his sweetheart, who is, according to O'Brien, an astonishingly pretty girl. And this lights off some cheerfulness once again in Jack's mind. Uh, Mr. Pullings Sr. is a farmer. Lots of the feast that's set out on the table here have been contributed by Mr. Pullings and the rest of the Pullings family. Here's the feast. We've got the master's mates and the junior lieutenants. That's Pullings' peer group. We've got Mr. Pullings representing the family, thanking Captain Aubrey for his kindness to Pullings himself. And the food and drink flow, and Jack is enjoying the conversation. He's listening to Mrs. Pullings talk about her anxiety about her son Tom Aubrey's running away to sea with nothing but the clothes he was wearing. And Stephen interrupts this to ask an apparently kind of naturalistic question about this particular thing, this particular ingredient that he's found in the pie. It's clearly a truffle, a princely truffle. And the two of them then get to talking about mushrooms and the and the hunting and the digging of them uh, for quite some time. Tom's joy, meanwhile, joy as grand and royal and spreading as an admiral's, overcomes all the anxiety in Jack's mind, all of his concerns about the polycrest, how she'll sail, all of that, he says, leaving him the cheerful lieutenant he had been not so very long ago, which is very touching. Was Jack Aubrey back as a lieutenant at the beginning of Master and Commander a better or happier man than the Jack Aubrey that we see sitting here now? Well, apart from the friendship with Stephen Maturin, don't know. Mm. And it is nice. I mean, Jack doesn't often get much introspection or self-knowledge, but he's kind of seeing himself uh, in the men gathered around this table, the relatively junior officers around this table. And this is very touching. It's Jack's naval family, really. So they toast the king, they toast Lord Nelson, they toast wives and sweethearts, may they never meet. And they toast Tom's girlfriend who's there. And everyone joins in, in a chorus of everyone's favorite sea song. I'm not going to say sea shanty, sea song, uh, Spanish ladies. Let's have a listen to a little bit of Spanish ladies and listen out for the ranting and the roaring. Farewell and adieu to you Spanish ladies, farewell and adieu to you ladies of Spain, for we've received orders to sail for old England, we hope in a short time to see us again. We'll rant and we'll roar like true British sailors, we'll rant and we'll roar all on the salt seas, until we strike soundings in the channel of old England, from a shant to silly, tis thirty Mike, th- this part is swinging by the sound of it. We've got truffles in the pie, and we've got food and drink, and we've got toasts, and we've got song. What could possibly go wrong? Right, right. And, you know, it's it's funny, and you, you say, what could possibly go wrong? And I can't help but remember that in the film Jaws, we had this guy singing this particular song as kind of oh, a... Yeah. You know, a you know, it, it's sort of a, a tune that prophesied the doom of their mission against this big shark. And I thought, OK, that was that was like after O'Brien wrote this, I think. But it came up in my head here. So right. but in the midst of all this singing, it's so loud that only Stephen sees Scriven crack the door and stick his head in. And, and Stephen, you know, is like, oh, wait, what's going on? And he puts his hand on Jack's elbow as if to warn him. And all of a sudden boom, the bailiffs are crashing through the door, swarming all over the place. And Stephen jumps at Pullings, hollers at Pullings to to grab the man who's got this long tip staff here. Stephen throws his chair under the legs of these guys and grabs Broken Nose, the one who had tried to board the polycrest. Jack jumps up to a window and is going to jump out of this first floor window as this whole melee is, is kind of surging towards him across the floor there. But he sees that the tip staff has already positioned men below the window to catch him if he tries to escape. So Jack turns towards the water where hopefully Bondin and his crew from the boat are eating and drinking what they've sent out to him. And he hollers, Polycrest, you know, as loud as he can. And he hears Bondin call back, sir. Jack says, come on the double and bring your stretchers. And they know that this call for these long wooden footrests means there's a fight in progress. And some of the guys there are thinking, oh, good, they're pressing men. And, you know, as press men themselves, they didn't want to miss a minute of this. (laughs) If they got them, they were going to get some of them. And as Jack's men, you know, being led by bonding, get there, Jack jumps down among them and they all take off towards the boat. Well, 
the tip staff and the rest of the others come out of the building, gather, you know, those men that are kind of standing around there a little dumbfounded, and they head after Jack shouting, way there in the name of the law. So telling him to stop. And, you know, fighting breaks out between the, the you know, the bailiff's men and the sailors. Bonden grabs the bailiff's staff, throws it far down the lane and says, well, mate, you know, you've lost your commission now. And he says, if he doesn't let Jack alone, you know, he's got to watch out. He's going to come home by weeping cross, meaning expression that says he's going to be grieving or mourning. Well, the bailiff pulls out his hanger and hanger being a sort of a small sword, similar to a cutlass and hurls himself at Jack. And that's it. Bonin smacks him across the head with his stretcher. This guy goes down in the mud. He gets stepped on and Jack looking back cries at pullings to press all those men, including that fellow in the mud, <laughs> broken nose <laughs> saying, you know, what a prime hand he'll make. Uh, Jack says, once he's used to our ways, he's a proper bulldog of a man. So here it is. Bondage just arrived back. He's kind of leading this fight. They're running out. And I think Jack probably, you know, going from being so scared of all this stuff is back to his young lieutenant days a little bit more, too. Here we oh. are. You know, I dust <laughs> up with my guys on the land here and we're making our getaway. I, I love the sequence when somebody finally gets around to making the TV miniseries of the Patrick O'Brien books. This is going to be a great set piece. I just love the, yes. the, the, the pictures I have in my head of this fight and Jack jumping from the, the, the first floor window and all that. And it's just in time, right? We've only just got Bonden on side and he's the one who can lead the lower deck hands to come and take care of the, the, the bailiffs. It's also fascinating that I, I, I never noticed it on my first reading, but it seems that many people of the O'Brien fandom reading and discussing the books online are pretty sure that Scriven sticking his head around the door just as this action all kicked off was a sign that Scriven had been the one who had tipped off the local bailiffs. And fair to say that this is the last we hear in person of poor old Mr. Scriven. Anyhow. We can't say for sure that he was the the person who betrayed them. I think lo- lo- lots of us are, and I think I'm I'm with everybody on the evidence for that. Now, the dust has settled. We're back aboard the Polycrest. These bailiffs have been pressed. It's five in the morning, and the Polycrest sails from the harbour, taking advantage of a change in the wind. She's got little more than topsails flying, and she's making two knots, which is a very sedate pace. Jack is planning to tack because he knows this. Uh, Headland, Celsi Bill is coming up. He's got plenty of room, he thinks, because the, he can hear the foghorns of the fishing boats are, are way off under his lee. And he's sorry, since this is his first time sailing the Polycrest, that he can't see the horizon to get some kind of perception of where he's at. But he's glad to have gained some hours at sea. He's been on fire, he says, to figure out how the Polycrest handles. And as the sort of sailing passage here unfolds, Jack and Goodridge the Master are trying to make sense of the really odd kind of cussed handling of this strangely designed ship with two ends. She's an odd brute, they concede, but at least she's dry, even with all the sliding keels and whatnot. She's not making much water in the well. Now, Jack, having tried the helm out and tried to figure out what her balance feels like, uh, tries to get some time to sort of stride about the place and think he tries to recreate his quarter deck walk from the Sophie and he's mentally kind of figuring out the balance and the thrust and the forces in the rig and the hull of the polycrest and he's got this picture of her in his mind and he's kind of studying in a thought experiment his reaction to the forces and I, I love this idea of Jack being able to visualize all of the forces at once his little reverie here, though, is interrupted. The afterguard comes on deck and they start cleaning, cleaning the deck because it's morning. He hears a couple of things that are important signifiers of what's happening. He hears the steady chant of a man heaving the lead. He hears the bosun's mate starting men, which means encouraging them with a, uh, a stick or a rope's end. And he's continuing to examine, meanwhile, in his head, the, the image that he has of the ship. He's imagining the angle of the mast and he says, OK, OK. Make it so just there. So he's kind of Im- imagining the raking of the masts in real time in his head. Really, really great seamanship. I'm, I'm sure Patrick O'Brien had no idea of what it would mean 
to calculate the center of effort and the balance of your, of your own square inch. But he does a really good job of convincing us that we know what it's like to be in Jack Aubrey's mind as he's taking care of this. And Jack reflects that he's really happy to be back in his own element. It was not, says O'Brien, that he did not like the land. Capital place, games, such fun. But the difficulties there, the complications, were so vague and imprecise, reaching one behind another, no end to them. Nothing a man could get hold of. Here, although life was complex enough in all conscience, he could at least attempt to cope with anything that turned up. Life at sea had the great advantage that, oh, something was amiss. Uh, before we get into what's amiss, Mike, I just could say I, I love the writing here. I love being in Jack's point of view, and I love the contrast with um, being ashore a, a earlier on. We had like the, the the respectable town, which becomes a den of squalor when the seamen are there. The seamen, on the other hand, become a bit more innocent and a bit more easily, you know, at, at, at peace with themselves when they are away from land and at home at sea. Yeah. Yeah, and, and something we you know see throughout the canon. This this yeah. kind of you know semen at shore, semen on land, absolutely. Well, and I love this idea. You know, we've heard before, and I'm trying to remember if it was mentioned in Master and Commander, probably so, of Jack. You know, kind of being asleep, but still knowing somehow intuitively yeah. what's going on around him. And now it seems like this in the middle of this deep thought experiment, he knows it, and so he's trying to figure out what what it is. What's amiss here? And then he realizes that these fishing boats that were on a parallel course with the Polycrest are now far astern. Their sound is coming from the ship's wake. And he thinks, oh, my gosh, I need to go about. And he's thinking, well, you know, I, I probably should just wait a while, you know, wait till the watch below is on deck. But, but you know, she may have made much more leeway than they had allowed for. And he thinks, okay, yeah. And he gives the order for her to go about. So all hands are called. They, you know, you're rousing everybody up from downstairs. And the seasoned hands are in place 10 minutes before a lot of the new hands are, you know, kind of been directed as to where to go. And Jack gives the order ready about. And the polycrest starts to move in this long, smooth curve in the direction of the wind. And so when he's ready to attack, he orders mainsail haul. And then Jack realizes, wait a minute, out in the darkness, the sounds that he's been hearing are the breakers on Celsi Bill. So, oh my gosh, mm. the ship has made two or three times the leeway that he and the master had kind of reckoned for. And now he sees she's going to miss stays. And if she can't stay, she has to wear. But that requires much more leeway than they have. And, and Jack's mind is starting to run through the alternatives. You know, do I try to tack again? Do I wear and 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 risk it, but but I can always you know drop the anchor if there's not room. But oh my gosh, that's going to waste so much time. Or box hauler. But wait, can I do that with this crew? And I, and I love this. You know, I can just see this. You know, in in kind of the more recent Sherlock Holmes episode. <laughs> you know, in British television. You know, watching Sherlock's mind go and and stuff yeah, like that. I'm sort of yeah, thinking yeah. Jack doing the same thing here. But then there's a fascinating little thing going on. At the same time, right, speculating in his corner of his mind about what how, how this might all be seen, about the potential injustices lying in wait for him. A small corner of his mind says the text called out shrilly against the injustice of missing stays, unknown in such conditions, monstrous, a malignancy designed to make him late on his station, to allow Hart to call him an officer like no seaman, a dawdling sybarite, a slow ass. And it's this bad view of him in the mind of the Admiral that's the real peril. He's not so much worried about going aground. He's worried about how is it going to look? How's his, how's his career and his profile in the Navy going to be affected? But, he says, a consciousness of having misjudged things and the likelihood of an ugly, unanswerable rebuke from a man he despised. Huh. Mm -hmm. So... This is what's really weighing on Jack's mind. The seamanship part he can take care of. What's uncertain and bugging him about the future is how's it all going to go with Admiral Hart? He hears the splash of the lead. The bottom is getting shallower. They're getting closer and closer to running out of water. He gives orders to box haul her. And box hauling is basically heading up into wind, letting the ship go backwards, and then using the rudder to get the ship's head round onto the new course. It's a sort of slow-ish version of a handbrake turn, if you like. Um, but it kind wow. of depends on the fact that going astern is an unnatural and sort of awkward thing and an unstable thing. 
for a regular ship. But let's see what happens when the polycrest goes through this box hauling maneuver. The polycrest's headway stops. She begins to move backward, and it turns out she's very good at going astern with this strange double-ended uh, hull shape. She goes around. The wind is now abaft the beam, so she should be easily ready to make up ground on the on the new tack. She should be going forward, but she continues in the wrong direction with remarkable speed, despite whatever Jack does. He calls this an insane contradiction of all known principles. And I love the, this little cinematic moment described to us. Jack catches sight of a dumbfounded, appalled glance from the master just before, at long last, they get this strangest straining groan from the ship. Polycrest kind of shudders from being going backwards to bare immobility to going ahead again. And we breathe a sigh of relief. Jack and the master breathe sighs of relief. They dismiss the watch below and Jack gets to walk into his cabin just to take stock of the moment here. The crew had done pretty well. They hadn't lost time and they'd come away from the manoeuvre, you know, all, all in good shape. And he sits on the locker and he hears the activities of the morning cleaning routine going on above him. The long interrupted sounds of cleaning. A bear, a great padded shot laden block of stone, started growling on the deck 18 inches from his ears. He blinked once or twice, smiled, and smiling, went fast asleep. I'm oh, like, sh- surely no coincidence that we got another mention of a bear here. Right, right. I love this. And, and I thought to myself, wait a minute, you know, bear of a man, there's a bear growling overhead. And I thought, well, just out of curiosity, let me go to singularity and, and look. You know, how many times does O'Brien use bear in post-captain, including, you know, bearing? But you know, how many times does he use it when he's not speaking about Jack and the bear and the bear leader and the bear costume? It's over 70 times. So hang in there. Wow. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of bear <laughs> references here. But I know I needed that little bit of humor after that close call with the box line. Right. So, you know what, speaking of what, a little humor, the close call, all of this, maybe it's time for a bit of refreshment. What do you think, Ian? That's a great idea. We'll be right back after a little break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hold. Welcome back. I, I hope you are a little more comfortable, like Jack sleeping away there. And Jack continues. He sleeps right through the hands dinner. He sleeps through Stevens' first dinner with the Polycrest officers in the gun room. Now, Pullings isn't there because he's got the watch. And O'Brien takes us up to kind of peek at Pullings. He says that Pullings is trying to imitate Captain Aubrey's pacing on the quarter deck, but he has to remember to look stern every now and then, like a right tartar, in spite of his bubbling happiness, O'Brien writes here. So I'm, I'm loving this view. And back in the gun room, we, we find that Parker, the, the first lieutenant, sitting at the head of the gun room table with this disapproving look on his face. And this is Stephen looking around. McDonald, a black haired Scottish lieutenant of Marines. Ah, oh, Scottish officer of Marines. Love that. <laughs> Always need one of that. Maybe missing a German flute, but I'm sure there's time for that. That's right. Well put. Well put here. He said this this Scottish officer's face is so full of smallpox scores, it's hard to tell what his expression is. Huh. Mr. Jones, the purser, is next, but at the sight of his food being brought out, he runs from the table with a watery belch, so Stephen doesn't get to suss him out much. And finally, there's the master sitting there. Now, Stephen, you know, this is his first time with them together. He's got a lot on his mind. He's silent at first. But because Stephen is silent, his messmates, knowing that the surgeon is the captain's particular friend, are also quiet as well. So mm. we've got this the first gun room <laughs> dinner, not quite like some of the gun room dinners we see throughout the canon. But that changes a little bit once Stephen's gotten some food down in him and, and his appetite gets quelled a bit. Yeah. And he gets to start an interesting conversation running. It's not always guaranteed that Stephen Maturin can. Uh, kick up an interesting conversation in the gun room, but he manages it this time. He asks then, 
about the function of the curious sloping metal line cylinder in front of where his storeroom is. And the master of Goodridge explains how this cylinder seems to be a combustion chamber for a kind of rocket or even a mortar shell. The inventor of this rocket had apparently come to his sticky end in a test firing of the device, sticking his head inside to check on an apparently dud shell. And this is reflected on sadly, and Parker and the others decry the whole idea of this kind of innovation. This This will never catch on in the traditional Navy. And Mr. Goodridge says, well, it it might have been better then if the whole ship had gone to the bottom. He's never seen, he says, a cranker, more unworthy craft. He's never seen one that makes more leeway than a common raft, despite having a sharp floor and sliding keels. She gripes like a man trap, he says. And Mrs. stays in the mill pond. It's clearly a, a reference to the tacking episode that they've just had. She reminds me, he says, of Mrs. Goodrich, whatever you do is wrong. Okay, there's a bit of chauvinism going on there. Well done, fella. Right. He says, it's the Lord's blessing that we have a right seaman in command. He's talking about Jack. If Jack hadn't boxholed her, something he, the master, wouldn't have tried with this crew, there's no telling what would have happened. Even the Archangel Gabriel can't do anything, though, if it comes on to blow. The channel's not broad enough. There's no sea room in, available anywhere in the channel that will help a, a, a slovenly ship like the Polycrest. The craft needs, he says, the Southern Ocean at its widest point, if you're going to talk about sea room. And by the way, we've got yet another reference here to a poorly built ship being lost in a storm, very similar to the fate of Bondon's nephew aboard the York, although the York didn't have the design weirdness that the Polycrest has here. And just as we're beginning to doubt the steadfastness of Polycrest as a a conveyance, Mike, the weather starts to kick in. It does. It does. You know, they're talking about this and the polycrest hits this huge roll, sends the bread plate flying over the gunroom table and flings a midshipman into Jack's cabin, who's come to report that the wind has shifted. And now we know. And Jack's looking at this mouse like child. He's stiff in his best uniform, has a dirk by his side. Looks like he's actually slept in the uniform. And Jack yeah. asks his name. Jack you know, couldn't remember it. He just met him, I think, the once. And he says, Parslow. And Jack says, oh, right, right. The commissioner's protege, a naval widow's son. And Jack says, well, what, what's that big lint-covered wound on your face? And Parslow, little Parslow, is so proud. He says, I was shaving, sir, when a big wave came in. <laughs> Jack says, well, you know, uh, why don't you take that down and show that to the doctor? And, and please tell him with the captain's compliment to, to come have tea. And then Jack says, well, why are you in your number one rig? And he says, well, the other midshipman told him he should wear it as an example to his men since this was his first ever day at sea. And Jack's going, "Uh uh-oh, you know, they're (laughs) they're practicing upon him here. They are. are. Okay. You know, yeah, glad you did it. Now, I want you to go put on your foul weather clothes. Do you have some? And then Jack starts running down. Did they ask you to do this? Did they, you know, and he's like, like, okay. So he's running through all the hazing stuff. And he's thinking about what he may be subject to. And so he's about to tell him to have Babington help him with the foul weather clothing, you know, so he gets it on right. And then he remembers what he thinks to himself as Babington's inhuman barbarity to new mids. And so he tells Parslow to tell Babington with the captain's compliments to show Parslow how to put on his foul weather gear. In other words, all right, this little kid's under my protection. Let's let's do this right. Come on, Babington. Yeah, yeah. And it's still another little lever for Jack using authority, and in this case, for a benign reason, but you know, he can't trust the midshipman's berth to do something without putting his own name behind it. Anyway, back up on deck. There's rain, sleet, and spray. We've got this really nasty, short, choppy sea. The Polycrest, despite all of the earlier worries, is holding her ground, holding her course, but she's shipping a fair amount of water. Jack orders another reef to be taken in in the topsail, and out go the orders. There's cursing from the boatswain's men in the dirty weather, and Jack sees an experienced foremast hand miss his footing. And Parker gives this order, apparently it's a fairly common order, that the last man off the yard gets started with a rope's end. And Jack knows that the first man on will always be the last one off. And this is normally the one of the braver, more resourceful hands. And the punishment here only serves to discourage willing hands. It doesn't actually do anything to speed up the slow coaches. 
No one, he says, needs to waste their strength beating each other. But Jack can't say anything in public at the present time because he can't undermine what authority Parker currently has. This little occasion is broken up by the sighting of a sail. There are three ships coming directly in the Polycrest Wake. And Mike, our hearts beat a little bit faster for a moment here because we've had privateers and we've had enemy warships and we've had friendly warships all already in this book. But we learned that the first of these ships on the horizon is a British ship. She's the Amethyst. And with all the Polycrest's leeway, they're soon looking back at these people at an angle and the angle opens up with enormous speed. The third ship of this little squadron is Henrich Dundas's ship, the franchise. Henrich Dundas is Jack's old friend. He's five years junior, or he was as a lieutenant, but Henrich has got his step now. He's had 13 months as a master and commander, is now a post captain and very pleased with himself, waving his hat from the slide of a quarter deck carronade aboard the franchise. Jack raises his hat in turn and up goes a hoist, saying, Psalms. 147 10. And Jack, who is no Bible scholar, acknowledges that we have the sound of two guns, the frigates tack in succession in response to this signal. They move like models on a sheet of glass, in sharp contrast to the performance of the Polycrest tacking just a few paragraphs ago. They keep their station as if they were joined together by a rope. Such a beautiful maneuver in such a rough sea. Years of training and three well found ships as well. So, Mike, I think we've maybe heard this before. We're certainly going to hear it again. Uh, naval officers um, needling each other with scripture quotes. Um, tell us about this piece of scripture that we have here. Yeah, Psalms 147.10. So the, the verse itself, um, and I think this is King James. I Gosh, I should double check myself. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. So I, I think this is headage. Uh, both consoling Jack for, if you will, his poor horse, the Polycrest, <laughs> as well as kind of poking a little fun <laughs> at, at Jack, going, oh my gosh, what a poor horse you have. Luckily, God's not worried about that, you know. And not the first time and certainly not the last that we'll have ships set up and described in some way as horses, as, as the mount for their right. rider. Yeah. Right. Well, as the ships speed away, Jack tells Parker to get the top gallon mast down on deck and then wear. And Parker begs Jack's pardon with an anxious poke of his head. And, and I'm wondering, Parker not understand how to do this or why to do this or did he not hear him? But Jack walks away. He sees a dark bird just over top of the water with his legs dangling. And, and, and the bird kind of goes under the back of the ship and Jack runs to the side to see it come out. And he trips over something at about knee height on deck. And it's Parslow, this young midshipman in his Southwester. So he's, you know, he's got his foul weather gear on. And he asked Parslow to run below and tell the doctor that there's a stormy petrol if he'd like to see it if he comes up here on deck. Stephen does. And he realizes after a close look that it's not a stormy petrol. It's actually a very rare cousin to it. And Stephen thinks to himself, kind of looking around, if rarity and the force of the storm are in direct proportion, he says, then we are in for a most prodigious hurricane. But thinks to himself, you know what? I'm not going to mention it, however. We, you know, <laughs> Jack's got enough on his brain right now. And then there's this crash forward as this top gallant mass comes down to the deck much more briskly than would ever be managed on the smartest frigate. So we had these frigates that were doing great. And apparently the crew, some of these crew members are really good, even though Parker is not much of a seaman. And it says that this half stunned Mr. Parker and plunged Jack into maneuvers more suitable for a petrel than a mariner. So, uh oh, you know, thinking about this bird just outside the sea, you're zipping all around. Something's got to be coming up for Jack here. Yeah. <laughs> well, this it's a worry, right? We've got this ship that clearly is difficult to handle, probably not very well suited to stormy conditions, and the wind is blowing up here. It stays in the northeast or the north or the northwest, blowing hard for nine days, which means, of course, not only is it windy, there's going to be a really nasty sea running as well. They never get to more than close reef topsails. They're fighting for their lives now. It's winter, they're in a storm, there's snow, steep wicked seas... Jack rarely gets to leave the deck. 
Parslow, the midshipman, rarely gets to take off his clothes. There's no sign of sun, which means no navigational sight, no notion of their position to within even 50 miles. And finally, a strong southwester blows them to make up their tremendous leeway, and their noonday observation finally finds them back exactly where they started. So this is probably a good moment to just look back at all the description we've had of the Polycrest. She's got this odd combustion chamber rocket cylinder thing in the middle of her. She's got two pointy ends. She's got sliding keels. She gripes. She's very, very tender in the wind. And we kind of wonder, is this something that Patrick O'Brien invented or was it representative of something real? And Mike, we talked about this in our earlier shorter version of Post Captain. The ship is real and the name is an interesting choice that O'Brien's given us here. The word polycrest means something adapted to different uses. For example, a drug or a medicine serving to cure various diseases. And the Greek word that kind of is the foundation of this uh, refers to something having more than one peak and therefore meaning, in this case, pointed at both ends. Thanks, by the way, to the Patrick O'Brien Muster book for giving us a bit of this to dig into. Now, the physical form, this double-ended shape, seems to be taken, according to folks on Wikipedia anyway, seems to be taken from the the, the real-world class of ships called the Dart class. They had sliding keels. They were designed by a naval captain by the name of John Shank, which no is, a, is a noble surname, <laughs> sp- spelled a little differently, but still. And this design was used on several Royal Navy vessels from around this period. They had problems with the centerboard cases. Um, maybe this then sort of discouraged wider experimentation with this design. Unlike the Polycrest in fiction, who has this terrible leeway and propensity for missing stays, the real-world Dart and her sister ship called the Arrow actually performed pretty well during their naval service. The Dart was broken up in 1809, and the Arrow was captured by the French in 1805. And it may then be that there's a there's an amalgam going on here. The, the shape and the design and the purpose seems to be lifted from the Dart and the Arrow. Um, there was another ship designed to carry a secret weapon called HMS Project. Project was smaller than the Dart, had a very shallow draft to carry a new design of howitzer into coastal waters. Um, Congreve, the rocket guy who has been mentioned in the text already, designed this ship HMS Project with a flat bottom and with rudders at both ends. She was broken up in 1810 after only five years of service. And uh, interestingly, there's one more connection here, Mike. The first of these uh, nautical rocket projects that Congreve have ever designed was carried out aboard the bomb vessel HMS Etna. And HMS Etna was part of the squadron commanded by none other than Thomas Cochrane. So we're, we're never falling very far from the real world here. And of course, never very far from Thomas Cochrane. In the midst of, of this storm, uh, we find out that Parker early on had fallen down the main hatchway, hurting his shoulder. And so for the rest of this, he stayed in his cot in great pain with water washing all around him. Yeah, and while Jack was sorry for his pain, he was kind of glad that somebody so fond of inflicting agony got to experience a touch of it. Jack was glad the entire time not to have the incompetent Parker on deck. He says, you know, in thinking to himself, while Parker does his duty as he understands it, he is no seaman. And Jack, therefore, got to rely on real right seaman during the long blow. And because the ship had been close to foundering at least twice a day, you know, he crammed a great deal of training into a very short time. And uh, O'Brien explains, measured by the calendar rather than by mortal dread. <laughs> measured by <laughs> mortal dread. Probably seemed a lot longer here. But Jack is now thinking, boy, with everything everybody's gone through, you know, when we reach our station, we're not going to be a disgrace, even though he's shorthanded to start with. And now he's got 17 men in the sick bay. He thinks the crew doesn't look so good. You know, poor looking set. But every landsman can now walk the deck, you know, without doing harm to himself or others. Jack has had a little bit of time now to exercise them on the great guns and thinks, well, you know, he's going to be able to make a passable man of war out of the polycrest. And he also thinks he's going to do better when he alters her trim and rakes her mass. So, you know, this is all sounding good. And I, and I think Jack's thinking of this to himself, but then he has a little bit of a contrasting thought. 
Right. And he's trying to conjure up his own image, his own idea of what this ship of his really is. And the text says he could not love her. She was a mean-spirited vessel, radically vicious, cross-grained, laboursome, cruel in her unreliability, which, by the way, are great words to use for, for, for an awkward horse as well as for an awkward ship. Mm. And he could not love her. She had disappointed him so often when even a big canoe would have ridden, risen to the occasion that his strong natural affection for his command had dwindled quite away. He had sailed in some rough old tubs, ponderous things with no virtue to the outsider, but he'd always been able to find excuses for them. They had always been the finest ships in the history of the Navy for some particular quality. And this had never happened to him before. The feeling was so strange, the disloyalty so uncomfortable, that it was some time before he could acknowledge it. And when he did, he was pacing the quarter deck after his solitary dinner at the time, it gave him such uneasiness of mind that he turned to the midshipman of the watch, who was clinging motionless to a stanchion, and said, Mr. Parslow, you will find the doctor in the sick bay. Find him yourself, said Parslow. I might... This is a little bit of a turning point here. <laughs> Parslow right. was the cute one who was being uh, being hazed by the other midshipmen. What's going on here? Find him yourself. Right, right, right. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, all right, I got I to gotta get back to what's up with Parslow. But I'm thinking to myself, too, you know, Jack, who could find nothing to love about this ship for the first time ever, that doesn't bode well. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm thinking about in the movie when, you know, somebody says about the surprise being old and Jack comes to her defense so beautifully about, you know, she's not old. But here it is, Parslow. And, and Jack wonders, you know, I wonder if I, I really heard this, but he sees the looks on the faces of the men all around. And he knows, oh, yeah, I must have. But Parslow makes no doubt about it. He <laughs> continues on. I'll tell you what it is, Goldilocks, he says, closing one eye. Don't you try to come it high over me, for I have a spirit that won't brook it. Find him yourself. And Jack calls for <laughs> Parslow's hammock and the bosun's mate, telling the mate to tie Parslow to the gun in Jack's cabin. Parslow finally lets go of the stanchion. And that's, you know, that used to be our our idea of, you know, am, am I really too drunk? Well, if you can lay in the gutter without holding on to the curb, you're not too <laughs> drunk. Right. You have to hold. So he lets go of the stanchion and says he'll dirk any man who tries to lay a hand on him. He is, after all, an officer, he tells them. Well, the quarter deck hears a startled cry, terrible oaths, and then the thump of a rope's end coming from Jack's cabin. And Parslow comes out sobbing bitterly, being led by the hand. And I thought, oh, my God. You know, oh, here's Jack holding this guy by the hand, bringing him back out. Jack orders him lashed into his hammock and stops the midshipman's berth's grog. So maybe this is just tyranny. Maybe this is like Parslow has to tolerate the the, the hazing and the, and, and the brutality here. But just for a second, we get to hear both sides of this kind of human story. Jack explains to Stephen that the first time the blackguards in the midshipmen's berth are not up to their knees in water and can enjoy their watch below, they could think of nothing better, he says, than to get a youngster drunk and send him up on deck. So he, Jack, has stopped their grog. Because that's the real cause of this problem for little Parslow. Stephen says, well, you could go further. You could stop the entire ship's grog. And he goes on to talk about how many men come under his care, having hurt themselves while going aloft drunk or going about the ship whilst they're drunk, doing things they could easily do when they're sober. Why don't we, he says, go and secretly pour all the rum away. And Jack goes, no, no, thank you. I'd rather have them drunk now and then and willing to do their duty the rest of the time than have a mutiny. And he goes on to hint to Stephen about how difficult it is hateful it is to think about men that you work with every day breaking up no longer happy divided into camps rolling cannonballs on the deck at night to let you know they are unhappy maybe hoping to catch an officer's legs and a foreshadowing here we've had foreshadowings of shipwreck and now we've got foreshadowings of mutiny this is all making you and me and jack fans and stephen fans and maybe polycrest fans if there are any out there feel a little bit uneasy mike well, it does. And, and it gets worse. You know, yeah. here's all this talk of this. And Stephen says, well, you know, generally I'm in favor of mutinies. You know, after oh. all, these men, right. I know. Right. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. Seriously? <laughs> really? Are we going here? You can this think it, but you shouldn't say it. <laughs> right. 
Men are taken from their homes, their chosen occupations, confined in unhealthy conditions, subjected to the tyranny of the bosun's mates, exposed to unimaginable perils, and defrauded of their meager food, pay, and allowances of everything except, Stephen says, and O'Brien writes, this sacred rum of yours. Stephen says, well, you know, I would have joined the mutineers at Spithead. I was astonished by their moderation. And Jack, I'm astonished by Jack's moderation. Jack replies, yeah. Pray, Stephen, do not speak like this, nattering about the service. It makes me so very low. I know things are not perfect, but I cannot reform the world and run a man of war. In any case, be candid and think of the Sophie. Think of any happy ship. Oh, all right, Jack, well done. Yeah. And Steve is not going to let go of this. I mean, it, even by Stephen's standards, he's being a bit cross-grained and, and not really listening for what's happening with his friend here. He keeps going. He says, there are a few happy ships, but that all depends on the whim, on the digestion, on virtue of one or two men, he says. And that is iniquitous. Iniquitous. I am opposed to authority, that egg of misery and oppression. I am opposed to it largely for what it does to those who exercise it, which is a direct fling at Jack. Jack says, well, authority's done me no good. You know, I, I haven't sought and profited much by authority. Today I've been savaged by a midshipman and harassed by my own surgeon. And he's clearly trying to kind of pull Stephen up a little bit here and strike a bit of a light note. Why don't we have a drink and then have some music? And Mike, I love this next piece about the bolt, not only because now that you step back and look at it, it's a really nice juxtaposition. A ship, Jack argues, is held together by the loyalty and the submission, in a way, of the crew and by the, the authority of, a, of a, ideally a wise and non-tyrannical fighting captain. And that's what holds the ship together spiritually. What holds the ship together physically are these bolts. And he shows Stephen what he calls a robber bolt, which is a short, solid copper cylinder with a great nut on the end. And he explains to Stephen that the best bolts holding the whole ship together are copper from end to end. But corrupt builders would chop out the middle of the bolt, basically hammer the two ends from opposite sides into the planking so it looks like the bolt is there. But the whole thing is fake. It's a sham and it erodes and corrodes away so that the ship will just drop to pieces in a, in a storm. And... Without authority, I think he's arguing, and or O'Brien's letting him argue, without authority, the ship is as much in danger as if it were held together by these robber bolts. And I think Stephen is genuinely set back by this explanation. He says, how did you find out about this? And Jack, it turns out, has suspected it from the start, seeing how well off all the dockyard workers were. He had wanted to take her out to sea to see what she could do uh, so that he might still have time to get her back ashore and fixed if she needed it. Although, Mike, that, that does sound like a gamble, given what we know about the vagaries of being at sea, and given what we know as well about the command authority of Admiral Hart. But there you go. Yeah. Maybe it's another good argument in support of Stephen's stance on mutinies. Who knows? Right. right. I, I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing. And it was really chilling to me, you know, when they were talking about this, that Jack was saying, you don't know when you're first leaving. And sometimes you never know because, and I'm thinking back to that York incident, you know, these guys get yeah. lost in a storm. And if there are no witnesses, nobody can say, oh, this was due to shoddy construction. It's just a ship yeah. lost in a storm. But Jack then changes the subject again. And he asks Stephen about Parker's injuries. And, and he kind of tries to lead the witness a little bit. He suggests that I'm sure Parker won't be fit for duty for quite some time. You know, maybe he should be laid up on shore. Maybe he should take the waters. And Stephen says, no, no, he's doing fine on Dr. Ramos's thin water gruel. And he may come on deck tomorrow. And Jack is like, no, no, no. And so he looks wistfully into Stephen's face and he says, no sick ticket, no long leave. Wouldn't the waters also help his deafness? But, O'Brien tells us, in his duty as a medical man, Dr. Matron would not budge for man, God, or beast. And he was, as O'Brien writes, beyond the reach of reason or even friendship. So, <laughs> ouch. Mm. There's, there's a little plant going in here. There's a plant that 
Jack is clearly mistaken, albeit in a fairly kind of low-key way. He's, he is mistaken in his effort to undermine Parker's authority by saying, oh, maybe he's sick, maybe he should go ashore, maybe he doesn't belong in the, in the post that he's in. Um, watch out for that plant and the payoff that might be coming in a chapter or two. Meanwhile, Stephen picks up the fiddle that he sees. This is not Jack's Amati. This is a cheaper fiddle, a seagoing fiddle that he's picked up at a pawn shop. He admires the tone of this old violin. And uh, he says, I need to be going and doing my rounds at seven bells. So basically, let's have a tune. One, two, three, he cried, tapping his foot. And the cabin was filled with the opening movement of Boccherini's Corelli Sonata. By the way, no idea. Can't find any reference to a sonata written by Boccherini in, in name of Corelli. It seems to be one of those O'Brien fanciful music moments here. Anyhow, this sonata, a glorious texture of sound, the violin sending up brilliant jets through the cello's involutions. They soared up and away from the grind of pumps, the tireless barking, the problems of command. Up, the one answering the other, separating, twining, rising into their native air. And beautiful writing, Mike, and it's such a relief, having had all this awkwardness and foreboding, that at least this part of their friendship, the musical side of it, is still helping them both. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I think whenever things get really bad here, I, I've got to have a little Baccarini on in the background here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, love that. Well, the scene changes abruptly, and, you know, we don't often dig in, but... O'Brien says, you know, on a pale, wintry morning, and we know whenever he's starting to describe that scenery, it means something here. They're in the downs, and the Admiral is making the Polycrest number. And Jack goes over in the waiting gig in his best coat. He's, he knew this was coming. He passes a large number of ships, large ships, the Royal Navy ships, and looks back at 142 sail of merchant ships from the West Indies, Turkey, Guinea, and the India trade waiting to be convoyed when the wind changes. Everybody's kind of waiting for a favorable wind, and they're all going to be escorted up. Well, Jack goes up the 74-gun Cumberland side, the flagship there, greets her captain, and is shown into Admiral Hart's cabin. He looks at him, and Hart Jack thinks has aged shockingly since Jack last saw him, and he thinks his look of falsity seems to have grown more pronounced. So we, we yeah. know, no no love loss between these two. Well, Hart puts in a customary immediate dig here. So there you are at last, he says. You must have really dawdled coming up the channel. Expected you three tides ago, he says, upon his honor. And I love O'Brien's <laughs> line here. Admiral Hart's honor and Jack's dawdling were much on a par, and Jack only bowed. Well <laughs> Jack done, does Jack. not take the bait here. <laughs> and O'Brien writes that Hart continues with what he calls, O'Brien calls, an awkward assumption of familiarity and good fellowship. O'Brien explains that money is Hart's nearest approach to joy, his ruling passion. And that Hart had watched Jack put 10,000 pounds into his admiral's pocket in Mahan, where, of course, as, as heading the port there, Hart had no share of that. But now, as Jack's admiral, Hart wants to conciliate Jack's goodwill and wants that profit for himself. So he's thinking, ah, you know, might not like this guy, but he could make me a lot of money. Yeah. And going back to the ship, Jack doesn't get it. He can't understand Hart's drift. It makes him uneasy. There was no open hostility, which he expected. And the Polycrest is not going down with this convoy. And, and I assume, you know, we remember the first world was saying, you, you've got to get up there right away. And I think Jack's thinking, what, you know, all these ships are waiting to be convoyed here. But he is to spend time in the Downs helping man the squadron and harass the invasion flotilla, which is, as they write in quotes, over the way. Yeah. And from the Downs, it's going to be, what, 25, 30 miles away that the, there is the French coast. And at the time, there was a widespread fear that uh, Napoleon was going to send in, an invasion in, in barges. Ah. <sighs> so getting back to his ship, Jack senses something else that's out of tune. We were already not sure about where Hart is sitting with his attitudes to Jack here. But something's not right aboard the Polycrest either. 
Parker comes into the cabin to report a serious breach of discipline. And his report is that when Stephen came on deck that morning, he had seen a man with a marlin spike sewn into his mouth, running away from a bosun's mate who was beating him. And seeing blood from the man's mouth, uh, Stephen had stepped up, taken out a lancet, cut the spike free and thrown it into the sea. Parker was now protesting to Jack that the punishment was on his orders, it was perfectly legal, and that Maturin had attacked him, Parker, verbally with extreme ferocity, questioning his courage and his fitness to command. Parker says that he knew the captain would soon return and understood the doctor was the captain's friend, so he did not take decided measures, which I think, according to the letter of shipboard law, he would have been entitled to do. He did not go back to his cabin, as suggested, and did not stop walking the quarter deck when was told that it was Parker's prerogative. So there's a lot of finger pointing from Parker in the direction of Stephen here. Jack says that my friendship with Stephen Maturin is neither here nor there. He's surprised that Parker had mentioned it. The doctor explains Jack is an Irishman, eminent in his position, with little knowledge of the service and extremely impatient of being practised upon. And we've already had some of that hazing and practising upon in the messes, particularly in the midshipmen's mess. Jack says this has been a misunderstanding and recalls the doctor lashing out at a misplaced joke from the Sophie's master. Parker tries to defend this very unsuccessfully. A master is not a lieutenant, says Parker. And here comes Jack with both barrels. Now, sir, do you instruct me upon rank? Do you pretend to tell me something that is clear to a newly joined midshipman? Jack did not raise his voice, but he was pale with anger, not only at Parker's stupid impertinence, but even more at the whole situation and at what must come. Jack goes on to say that Parker's methods of discipline do not please him. Um, He had wished to avoid this particular conversation, although he thought that Parker would take the hint when he had told him that one of his punishments was perfectly illegal. He is not, he says, a preachy, floggy captain, and he will have no unnecessary brutality. He asks the name of the man that had been gagged by Parker. Parker doesn't know it. Another big black mark, as far as Jack Aubrey's concerned. Uh, It was a landsman, he says, a waster in the starboard watch. An inefficient first lieutenant, says Jack Aubrey, would know the name of his men. And he then tells Parker to go and find the name of this guy directly. So Parker's in for a bad day in the office here, isn't he, Mike? Uh, he, He really is. He really is. Well, Parker comes back and says, well, it was William Edwards was the man's name. Jack knows exactly who this guy is, unlike Parker. Jack says, well, he's a scavenger from Rutland who took the bounty. He's never seen the sea, a ship, or an officer in his life, and he has no notion of discipline. He asked Parker if if Edwards answered, and Parker said, well, he did. He, He answered when he was rebuked for slackness. And Jack says, well, why was he started? And Parker says, for going to the head without leave. And Jack says, you know, there's got to be some discrimination. You can't punish a man until he's been aboard long enough to know his duty and for the officers to know his name. (laughs) He's coming down hard here. He says, and in a half well-run ship, no one answers anyway. So don't beat any of the crew until after they know what's required of him. Yeah. Jack says, now, Parker, you're an experienced officer. You mistakenly thought Edwards intended gross disrespect. It's possible in the same way that Dr. Maturin, with no experience, misunderstood you. Jack says, let me let me see your defaulters list. And Parker hands him the list of all of these guys that are on his naughty list. And Jack says, yeah, this list will not do. It's as long as an ill-conducted first rates list. And it's filled with newly joined landsmen. So I think Jack back to making the point of going, look, these guys have no idea what to do. And you're you know, beating them. They don't even know what they've done wrong here. So he says, now we're going to deal with that later. And he passes the word for Dr. Matron. So I think he's tried to set Parker up here. I see what you were out of place. And, you know, to try to say now we're going to get Matron in. And he probably did exactly what you did. We're going to set this right. And it would be really easy for this to become a sort of temporizing. Jack Aubrey is going to make things easy and offer a nice, a nice landing, a soft landing for, uh, for Stephen Matron here. But he doesn't. We see Jack through Stephen's eyes as Stephen enters the cabin, larger than life, hard, cold, and strong, with a hundred years of tradition behind him, utterly convinced that he was right. Jack 
is very formal. It says, good morning, Dr. Maturin. There's been a misunderstanding. The doctor, he goes on to explain, wasn't aware that gagging was a naval punishment and mistook it for horseplay. Stephen says, I took it as a piece of extreme brutality. Edward is under my care for advanced dental decay and the iron bar had crushed two of his molars, so he removed it at once. And Jack doesn't debate. He just puts the nuanced or the naval version of this tale directly to both of them. You removed it for medical reasons, unaware it was a customary punishment awarded by an officer and knew nothing of the reason for the punishment. And Stephen spots which way the wind is blowing here and says, no, sir, he's agreeing. Jack says, you acted inconsiderately, spoke hastily to Mr. Parker. You must express some sense of your regret for the misunderstanding. And Stephen offers exactly that regret and offers to repeat the expression of regret in public. And Parker realizes he's been outmaneuvered here. He's got to do the right thing as well. So he he blushes. He says, no, 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 I'm entirely satisfied. Uh, And for my part, I regret any disobliging expression that may have escaped me. And Jack says, okay, I won't detain you gentlemen any longer. So Mike, Stephen is still able to spot which way things are flowing aboard a ship. Jack is able with his customary leadership to navigate what would otherwise be a tricky situation. If it were only these two men and the cabin, things might be okay. Right. Right. And, and, and it's, it's funny. And you're, you're exactly right. Well, they're getting up to leave. Jack gets up and he asks the Marine sentry, what is this infernal row I'm hearing outside? And the Marine says, well, the captain steward and the gunroom steward are fighting over the use of the coffee pot. And O'Brien writes, this is Jack. God damn their eyes, cried Jack. I'll tan their hides. I'll give them a bloody shirt. I'll stop their capers. Old seamen, too. Rot them. Mr. Parker, let us establish a little order in this sloop. So, get oh, no. <laughs> okay, Stephen, what were you saying about what authority does to people? Here we are, Jack, having just gone through all this, now loses it himself. However, to his credit, he's losing it over old seamen who should know better, not over yeah. you guys who don't know here. But that still leaves Jack in a little bit of a quagmire. Yeah, it does. I mean, maybe he's very judiciously taking the opportunity to put Parker on the right side of something. I think he's just lost perspective for a minute. He's had enough of all of them. And I I love this situation for the amount of royal jeopardy that it offers for Jack Aubrey. He and his first lieutenant don't see eye to eye about discipline, however carefully Jack navigates the situation. He and his particular friend, Stephen Maturin, are potentially at odds about many things, now also including shipboard discipline. And then Jack loses perspective and seems to join in on the hazing and the cruelty in in this particular kind of selective way, maybe making him look like a bit of a hypocrite. And this this all makes me kind of shake my head and wonder for what's going to happen next for Jack Aubrey. Later on, we get what feels to me like a slight repeat of the encounter in the previous chapter where Stephen had said, oh, I think I've, uh, I'm not coming to see. He says, Jack, I, I think I'm a sad embarrassment to you. He's basically offering to step away. I'll pack my chest and leave the ship. And Jack, I, I think with sincerity, says, no, soul, never say that. He says, I'd have needed to have it out with Parker, and I'm glad that I finally did. Stephen says, well, I still think it's good now for me to go ashore. And Jack comes back and says, if you'll desert your patients, no, says Stephen, they can get another surgeon. Desert your friends, Stephen says, Jack will be better off without him. There can't be discord among the officers. And Stephen doesn't want to be a witness to or a party to the brutality in the ship. He's basically saying, don't don't leave me in the gun room where I can only say what I truly believe. And that's going to put me at odds with all the other members of this military unit that I'm part of here. Jack says, well, hold on a minute. You didn't mind flogging in the Sophie. And Stephen explains that flogging is accepted in the nautical world. But Stephen can't stand the arbitrary punishments, the bullying, the hazing, the starting, the general atmosphere of oppression. He would have raised it earlier, he says with Jack, but it's a delicate subject between them. Has been since all the way back in the Sophie. Jack is still temporizing and kind of rationalizing. Well, he says, it's the beginning of a commission with a raw crew, and it's always worse then. They have to be driven hard, he says, but Parker and the bosun have gone too far. Jack didn't give them a strong enough lead from the beginning. That's Jack confessing that it's his fault, mea culpa. 
uh, it's going to be different going forward. And Mike, this just sounds like a uh, a couple in a relationship going, I can change. I can change. Mm-hmm. It's going to be different from mm-hmm. that one, which is sweet but agonizing. Stephen is not having any of it. He says, these men, he's referring to Parker and everybody else who's doing this starting, these men are dropsical with authority and permanently deranged. He must go. And Jack has his final turn of the cards to play here. I say you shall not, said Jack with a smile. I say I shall. Do you know, my dear Stephen, that you may not come and go as you please, said Jack, leaning back in his chair and gazing at Stephen with placid triumph. Do you know that you're under martial law? And he tells Stephen, you know, if you leave, I'm going to mark you as having run. and I'm going to have you brought back in irons and most severely punished. O'Brien goes on. What do you say to a flogging through the fleet, huh? You have no notion of the powers of a captain of a man of war. He is dropsical with authority, if you like. He, the captain, is. It's like, oh my gosh, you think these guys are bad? You're dealing with the captain here. And this kind of pauses Stephen for a minute here. I'm, I'm kind of wondering where Stephen's going to go about this, you know, being threatened with flogging around the fleet. I can kind of see Stephen going ballistic. But but he doesn't exactly. Must I not go ashore? No, of course you must not. And that's the end to it. You must make your bed and lie on it. A little, little baby Aubreyism on the down low there. And Jack goes on and tells Stephen about his interview with this scrub heart. Uh, and afterward, Stephen says, if then, as I understand you, we are to spend some time in this place, you will have no objection to granting me some day's leave of absence. Apart from all other considerations, I must get my dement and my compound fracture of the femur ashore. The hospital at Dover is, at an inconsiderable distance, a most eligible port. Certainly, cried Jack, if you give me your word not to run, so that I have all the trouble of careering over the country after you with a posse, a posse navitatum, (laughs) certainly, at any time you like to name. And when I am there, said Stephen deliberately, I shall ride over to Mapes. End of chapter seven. Wow. Ah, Mike, still still just about on the edge here, this friendship between Stephen and Jack. Um, There is a nice further little Latin button on this whole chapter, which which is a bit of humor in itself, right? The posse navitatum. Yeah, and Karen once again, you know, Karen says, you know, I I think this is just like a sound-alike pun meaning sort of posse of sailors, posse comitatus, usually, a, a, you know, posse of sheriff's men. And I think yeah. she says that Jack has just sort of reached for the Latin syllable nav, like navigation, all the yeah. nautical things, sailors and ships plugged into the comitatus template and got the final letter wrong. Just Jack trying to be witty and, and we get the joke. But most of this chapter is no joke. No, it's really not. <laughs> yeah. It's it's chilling, right? We've got the diary reflections at the beginning about Stephen and Jack both pursuing Diana and Stephen kind of seeing this for what it is. They both had sort of sensed this at Queenie's party, but now they're both noticing that it's Diana that's at the heart of the relationship. We didn't get back to that subject in this chapter, but that still doesn't mean that it's gone. And hence Stephen's parting shot here about going to Mapes. As, as it turns out, he might not have to go as far as Mapes to catch sight of Diana Villiers, but we'll come to that in the next chapter. And Mike, Mike, I loved your point about sense and sensibility here with that Bronte quote, you remember? Yeah, yeah. And 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 Karen, again, hats off to you that we've had this sense and sensibility thing going on with Stephen, the Enlightenment guy who's always about telling Jack, you've got to weigh this thing up rationally. But here's Stephen really getting into his emotions, getting you know, much more of a romantic figure in some ways, both in his relationship with Jack, which is a little bit more on something, you know, this give and take, I need to get more than I'm just giving here. But also he's hurt by some of this. And Jack, he's thinking, you're just not seeing this. It's like the husband that's always off to work and watching sports games yeah. and stuff. And Stephen yeah. is, the, is the spouse on the other. And so it's fascinating to see him as a bit of a Bronte character here, a bit more <laughs> the romantic side, the sensibility side of Stephen here. Yeah. And of course, some of what's going on with Stephen is familiar to us. Like we saw back in Master and Commander, what he knows and believes about authority and its impact on the people that, that, that carry it. 
all this talk of mutiny and Stephen's support for it, it's it's very, very depressing for Jack. And it feels very dangerous, I think, for us. Like Eventually, that has to lead to some serious conflict between Jack and Stephen. If you know the movie, you're probably sitting there waiting for Jack to come up with his line about uh, Stephen's come to the wrong shop for anarchy. I think that's going to come up in the canon, but maybe just not yet. We might be... We might, right. we might be on, on on the territory of spoilers there. Right, right, right. Oh, my gosh. And with all the interpersonal stuff, it's kind of easy to remember that stuff front and center and to also forget that we've got some real issues with the polycrest. Not only all these real issues about what's going to happen to or how she's going to sail, what's going to happen if they ever get into action or another real storm where they don't end up not needing that leeway. But this whole idea that this is, for the first time in his life, a ship that Jack can't love something about. Yeah. And it's just killing me with all the problems in his love life ashore. Now there's no ship for him to love at sea. I'm like, oh, my God. And not to mention that, oh, Jack, hate to tell you, but your your particular friend, Stephen, is not your particular friend right now, I don't think. And no, you're missing it all. When it comes to the object of his love. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And... It's tricky with his friend. It's tricky with his crew. It's tricky with his ship. It's tricky with his boss as well, Admiral Hart. It's so far so good, but Jack feels like this is this is not right. You know, Hart seems to welcome me as a potential source of prizes, but none of this feels like it's very solid ground. Wonder what's next then, Mike, for Hart and the orders that he might have for the Polycrest. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Because we remember when Jack first heard the First Lord talking to him about this, you know, Jack's saying, this is a guy that would love to ruin my career. Yeah, And so yes. it's like, all right, wait a minute. Is that really, is it, okay, it's all going to be money? I don't know. But it, it's funny, this whole thing, Stephen starting off the chapter, writing about their relationship, Jack's treatment of Stephen at the end of the chapter, you know, how about yeah. flogging you around the fleet, smiling over his command over Stephen, <laughs> overriding Stephen's desires for Jack's desires. You know, I think Stephen's really going, I need to get out of here. And Jack's like, oh, no, 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 I want to have you around. You know, he's kind of like my pet or something here. And and I think Stephen's probably just a little bit pissed at this point. You know, I keep right. trying to leave you. Yeah. You keep kind of either making me stay or being all miserable and I have to stay. And I note that, you know, O'Brien says Stephen deliberately says he's going to Mapes when he's going to shore. And I'm thinking, boy, we thought the Polycrest was a peril. Maybe Hart was a bigger peril in Jack's mind. In my mind, the peril might be the peril that this relationship is in between yeah. these two guys who we love so deeply here. Oh. Ah. <sighs> And we're still only in book two. Like, I mean, we, we have to keep reminding ourselves that this is really right. the beginning of the canon. We don't right. know where this is going to end up. We don't know how they're going to manage themselves. Uh, it's agony is what it is. Uh, and it's brilliant writing. And um, Mike, I, I, I think there's nothing else for it but to say this. What do you say next week to just a touch more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. <laughs> Sailing with the fabulous Captain Aubrey on this amazing new vessel, on this amazing new vessel, on this amazing. <laughs> there you go, Sam. <laughs> on this amazing new vessel.